In this video, we're going to learn about how to conduct a common statistical test for non-monotonic relationships. So just what is a non-monotonic relationship? A non-monotonic relationship between two variables is when the presence or absence of one variable's level is related to the presence or absence of another variable's level. For example, if we were in a given bathroom and we knew information about whether or not the person who uses the bathroom has a beard, so whether they do or don't, it's one variable and one status. If it helped us predict whether or not there would be a beard trimmer in that bathroom, there either is or is not a beard trimmer, by knowing one, it helps us predict the other. That's an example of a non-monotonic relationship. Also, there's no specific direction. There's no linear or non-linear relationship here because we're dealing with nominal or categorical variables. Monotonic relationships are the types of relationships where we have increasing or decreasing levels because we're dealing with interval or ratio level variables. So again, as a reminder, this is an example of a monotonic relationship. On the x-axis, we have the number of times that someone visited our website in the last 30 days. Each dot represents someone who we are tracking. And on the y-axis, we have the number of sloth gifts that they watched on our website. And we can see there is a monotonic relationship here because as the number of times they visit the website increases, the number of sloth gifts that they watch also increases. But we need an example of a non-monotonic relationship. So consider the following survey questions. By your best recollection, have you worn a fanny pack in the last year? Yes or no? A simple nominal categorical measure. Consider the following three types of activities. If you had to pick one, which would you say you most prefer? Attending a soccer match, visiting an EDM festival, or going to the beach? Again, this will generate nominal categorical data. Speaking of fanny packs, perhaps my favorite fanny pack video of all time is the 2015 Super Bowl commercial for the Super Glue product Loctite. They spent their entire annual advertising budget on this single clip. Here's a good time to catch yourself. A non-monotonic relationship is a relationship between two nominal variables. It's been my experience that the prefix non in front of non-monotonic tends to throw some students off, thinking non means no relationship. This is wrong. The phrase non-monotonic describes a type of relationship. We want to learn how to apply a common statistical test to test for the presence of a non-monotonic relationship. We're going to motivate this by way of example. Specifically, are people who live, work, or go to school in San Diego County more inclined to visit a restaurant specifically because of a beer that's on tap? This is a rather realistic example because there are these sort of prestige beers that exist in the craft beer industry. For example, Pliny the Younger is a rare triple IPA that's released infrequently. Restaurants and bars commonly do raffle tickets, charge extreme prices, and have hour-long waits and lines so people can taste this particular beer. To investigate this question to see if being in San Diego County has a particular influence on this behavior of chasing after rare beers at restaurants and bars, we will look at these two survey questions in our craft beer data set. Do you live, work, or go to school in San Diego County? A simple, nominal, two categorical variable. And in the last six months, have you done any of the following? Visited a restaurant or bar specifically because of a special keg of beer on tap? What specific statistical test should we use? We can use our handy dandy statistical test flowchart to determine that. Looking at our San Diego County variable, we can select the row one independent variable with two or more levels. Next, our tourism restaurant variable are three different levels, but they're all categorical. So we have a categorical nominal dependent variable, if you will, the thing that we are interested in observing changing. And that tells us that the chi-square test is the appropriate statistical test to use. So let's establish our formal hypotheses now that we know the right test. Our hypothesis is that there is no association between someone's affiliation status with San Diego County and their behavior toward visiting restaurants or bars specifically because of a specialty beer on tap. As we observed in the past, this is an example of the null hypothesis, no relationship. The alternative hypothesis is therefore that there is an association. This is the formal statement of the hypotheses. And as we've also gotten used to seeing, typically in marketing research projects, people just state the alternative hypothesis as the hypothesis, and we need to sort out which one is the null and which one is the alternative. Put even more concisely, the null hypothesis is simply there is no association between the two variables, and the alternative is that there is an association between the two variables.
So just what is the chi-square test? The equation's on the bottom left here. And when you use chi-square test, we're almost always talking about calculating it in the context of a crosstab. So I have an example of a crosstab here, variable A, variable B, and cells where there's hypothetical values in the middle. The chi-square statistic is the thing that we need to calculate. This is the value that we'll compare against to determine if there's a statistically significant relationship. K, here in our little summation, is simply the number of cells in our crosstab. We have nine in this particular visual example here, meaning we are going to have to do this summation activity nine different times. O, inside of this part of the equation here, is the observed frequency or the counts that might show up inside each one of the cells. E is the value that we would expect to see in the crosstab if there was no relationship, meaning the null hypothesis. We're going to have to calculate these values. We'll see that in play later. Once we have the observed and expected values, we can simply compute these, this simple equation nine different times, sum them all up, and determine the chi-square statistic. We test the chi-square statistic with a certain number of degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is simply the number of categories in one variable, minus one, times the number of categories in another variable, minus one. So we have three minus one here, so two, and three minus one, two here. So for this particular example, we would have degrees of freedom of four. Let's talk about how we're going to set up our analysis strategy to complete the chi-square test in Excel. First, we're going to make a simple crosstab of the two variables using the Excel pivot table. Then, we're going to make a stacked bar chart to visualize this data. Now, this isn't actually part of the chi-square test, but it's usually good practice to have a data visualization showing the analysis that we're conducting. Third, we're going to then use the crosstab data we made in step one to calculate some of the necessary values we're going to need to compute the chi-square test. Specifically, we're going to need to calculate those expected value things. At this stage, we'll take a pause and check an underlying assumption of chi-square test. That'll be easy enough to do once we calculate the expected values. Fourth, we'll complete the chi-square test using a simple function in Excel. And then finally, we'll interpret the results and report the results. In our step one, we're actually going to use the labels version of the craft beer data set to make a pivot table using our previously developed skills using the settings that are shown here. Once we create that table, we'll move on to step two, and we'll create a stacked bar chart using a pivot chart, another skill that we've developed previously. And we'll use the 100% stacked column setting. Let's hop over to Excel now and complete these tasks. Now before we proceed, let's take a look at this stacked bar chart. The no and the yes represent what people who do and do not have an affiliation with San Diego County. The proportions of their three an possible answers to this question are somewhat similar. They're not drastically different. However, people in San Diego County are a bit more prone to say that they actually are, have engaged in this behavior of going to a restaurant or bar for a chase beer. Also, if they haven't done it, they say they're a bit more likely to say they want to. After conducting a proper statistical test, the question is, can we conclude that there really is a meaningful difference between these two groups? Let's set up that statistical test. We need to do some necessary calculations to prepare for this. First, what we're going to do is we're actually going to take the data in our pivot table and copy and paste it into a new spot in our Excel spreadsheet. The reason we're going to do this is sometimes interacting with a pivot table from outside functions in Excel can be a little problematic. So by placed, pasting the raw values in a different spot, it'll be easier to work with. That'll be easy enough. We'll simply paste the values over into a new spot. I show it here a little cleaned up. And from there, we can proceed to create our calculations for the expected values. Let's hop over to Excel and set this up first. <laughs> 
Now we're ready to calculate those expected values. Again, the expected values are the hypothetical values that we would see in our crosstab if the null hypothesis was true, meaning it really was true, there is no relationship whatsoever. We actually know what numbers we would see if these two variables were independent of one another. It's actually pretty easy to calculate these values, especially if we know how to use absolute and relative cell referencing. It's a good chance for us to practice this skill. The way we calculate each one of these values in this expected values uh, crosstab here is simply take the row total value times the column total value and divide it by the grand total. We can see those functions here depicted. Let's hop over into Excel and see us building out these expected value functions. Why is the expected value so important again? Remember, we need to know exactly what values we would expect to see if the null hypothesis was true. In other examples of statistical tests, the null hypothesis is often zero, meaning there is no average score difference between the two groups or no difference in percentage. In this example, we need to know what values we would expect to see in our crosstab if there really was no relationship between two variables. Consider the following. Imagine we have a coin that we're going to flip heads and tails, 50-50, right? And we also have a die, a one to six sided die. Now, each one of these is independent of the other, right? It doesn't matter what we flip on the coin, it's not going to affect what rolls and shows up on the die. These are two independent activities. We know there's a 50% chance of heads showing up, and we also know that there's a 16.6% .6 chance of a six showing up on the die. Because these two activities are independent of one another, we can simply multiply their probabilities together to find out the joint probability of both occurring. In other words, if I flip a coin and roll a die, what's the percent chance I see heads and the number six? Multiply the two numbers together, and the answer is 8.3%. It turns out when two events are independent of one another, that's exactly how we calculate our expected value. They are independent. Now, we would never create this chart uh, for a report, but it does illustrate the idea here. I'm actually creating a chart on the right-hand side that shows our expected values if the null hypothesis was true. Notice that the proportions are completely equal between the two different San Diego County areas. Equivalent proportions means knowing their San Diego County status, yes or no, has no impact on our identification of their behavior. In other words, these two events are independent of one another. But that's not what we saw when we actually analyzed the real data. When we analyzed the real data, we saw some differences in the proportions, non-equivalent proportions. This suggests that there's evidence of a non-monotonic relationship. But is this real or is this just some random noise that's due to sampling? That's why we need to perform the chi-square test to know whether we're willing to conclude that this, this relationship is actually real. Now that we've calculated our expected values, this is where we do have to pause and check one of our assumptions to verify that it's okay for us to do the chi-square test. One rule of the chi-square test is that all of our expected values need to be greater than or equal to 5. Luckily for us, we're perfectly okay. No problem. This is important to check 
because you can calculate a chi-square test if your expected if your expected values are less than five in any one of the cells but because of a sort of small sample size problem we really can't meaningfully interpret those results so good thing we checked now what the heck would we have done if one of our cells had expected values of less than five well common solutions include merging Maybe we can take one or more of our different columns or rows and actually merge those categories together. For example, if we were analyzing a data set where we had uh, parents who had five to seven kids and we had a different group of parents who had eight or more kids, we'd probably expect that those groups would generally be very scarce. There's not too many of them in our data set. We could just maybe merge them together, so a five or more kids group to create a sort of larger sample size in that category. Another option might be that we can simply exclude that column or row from our data if that particular category isn't a particular interest for our analysis. Uh, for example, we may have a survey question on a survey where I don't know is a reasonable answer. Perhaps only 1% of respondents said that they didn't know the answer to a particular question. That would cause a problem probably for our expected values, but we could probably simply exclude those individuals. They're not part of our core analysis. And then a third possibility is we simply can't do the chi-square test. Whether it's due to an overall small sample or the groups that we really do want to analyze are important but just poorly represented in our data set, we may not be able to do it. So one of these three approaches is common if you run into an expected values issue. We didn't run into one, so we can go execute the chi-square test. Whew, we had to do a lot of work to set this up, but actually running the chi-square test is really easy. We simply use the chi-square.test function, and then we select our observed values inside one crosstab, and then we also select the array of expected values. And this returns a p-value for us. Assuming that we're using a standard 95% confidence interval, since our p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we are willing to claim that there really is an association between these two variables. Now, how would we interpret and report these results? First, if I chose to report my results in a table, notice that I made sure that I reported them as a percentage, not a raw count, and I show the percentages in a row percent manner because that is the way that's most consistent with the way I wanted to conduct my analysis. So I had to think through my percentage reporting carefully. I also reported the result of the chi-square test as a footnote in the table. In my writing, I note, we observe a statistically significant relationship, p-value less than 0.05, between someone's San Diego County affiliation and their behavior and intentions towards visiting a restaurant, specifically because of a specialty beer. Specifically, those from San Diego County were slightly more likely to have already done this or inclined to do so in the future. It is also noteworthy that among both groups, over 50% of respondents had indicated that they had already visited a restaurant for this reason. Looking at this reporting, I have to think back about all that work that I set up just to run the chi-square test. Only a tiny fraction of my reporting even notes that I conducted a statistical test and that those results suggest a significant relationship. The rest was just basic statistical summary reporting that I could have done with basic crosstabs alone. As always, it's very common that we, the analysts, have to do a good deal of work to run a, to set up and run a proper statistical test for relatively small amounts of payoff when we actually report the results. But that's the work that we do to make sure that when we report our results, it's not simply just due to simple sampling error. In this video, we introduced the idea of a non-monotonic relationship and provided several examples to understand exactly what a non-monotonic relationship is. We then identified an example of a research question that called for testing for a non-monotonic relationship. We identified the chi-square test was appropriate to use. We then analyzed our data set and set up and prepared our data set for the chi-square test using Excel. We implemented that test 
and then interpreted and reported the results. That's it.